Welcome to Career Conversations with Brads Who Write. My name is Bill Atkinson, and I'm doing things kind of in reverse, like Benjamin Button. I believe the intent of this was to introduce you to York alumni, grads, who then went on to a writing career. I only got uh, my degree from York last June. I got an MA in Science and Technology Studies, so I was a writer before I became a grad. Being a writer, however, is uh, it's a vocation, isn't it? it, it it's, you know, something comes down and touches you on the shoulder and you have to write. Having completed the MA, I'm going on to take a doctorate in science and technology studies. Uh, uh, I'm in LAPS, uh, a lapsed writer, and um, I'm looking especially at how um, popular literature, cult sci-fi uh, articles in magazines, can insinuate technical ideas into the worldview uh, of the public to the point where these simply become ideas in the air and then later, sometimes decades later, uh, these are turned into workable technology. My name is Rosemary and I am the author of the Ellis Portal Mystery Series. This is number six in the series. Um, I have written five others of this. I've written romance novels, I've written poetry books, I've had about 18 books published over the course of my career. I, my writing started for me when I was a kid. I wrote my whole life. I came to York in 1977. I graduated from graduate studies. It was so long ago that some of the textbooks were in hieroglyphics. I'm a, a director and a screenwriter, um, and uh, I did a master's in film at York in 2000, the year 2000. I'm a writer-director, so sometimes those overlap. Sometimes I'm just a writer, sometimes I'm just a director. So. As just a director, I'm working on my next film, which is an adaptation of a Philip K. Dick short story, which I'm extremely excited about. Uh, as just a screenwriter, um, I'm, uh, I've been hired to write a war movie by a producer named Ed Pressman, who produced Wall Street and American Psycho. And as a writer-director, I just finished, uh, I submitted my first draft of a script that I'm writing for Spectre Vision, which is Elijah Wood's production company. Uh, I'm working at a company called Forrester's Financial right now, so I started there this year as their content specialist in their marketing department. Two major projects we're working on this year are, we're redoing the entire corporate website, so every page needs new copywritten and that type of thing. And then I'm also doing their content marketing side of things. So they have a corporate blog that needs new articles and content produced daily and our social media accounts. So all those posts are a lot of what I'm writing right now. My name's Ronnie Bogle and I'm a senior technical writer. Self-employed, I've been doing this for about 20 years. I started at York in 78 and went into psychology um, to become a teacher. What got me into technical writing was as technology advanced, my secretarial roles basically evolved into IT type roles and um, currently I'm creating training materials and I've done a lot of that over the years. Companies and clients uh, evolved with technology. There was a huge gap in training materials so basically I take um, the, the techie information and bring it down into about a grade four level and um, write instructions, click here, click here. I spent my entire career until I got my MA last June with a, a high school education. This placed me in the interesting position of being a professor of uh, English writing at Seneca at York here with far less education than the students I was teaching. <laughs> it's been said that you can't teach anyone to write, you can't help them teach themselves. Uh, I began my career as a science writer, essentially. I'm doing what uh, one of my colleagues is doing here. I, I turned geek speak into English. I began working for the Steel Company of Canada when the thing existed back in 1971 in Hamilton. I uh, went from there to work as senior science writer for the National Research Council for eight years in Ottawa. Moved to Vancouver and worked for a forestry R&D organization, again interpreting highly technical things so that a uh, lay audience could understand them. Went out on my own, formed my own company called Draken Science Communications in 1991. Um, came back to Toronto in 2004 with my family and um, re-entered the academy. I had briefly gone to university in the 1960s, re-entered the academy to take my uh, MA degree uh, at York, so uh, I'm an alumnus. I also wrote some books. Uh, they have been fairly well received. 
Um, wrote a couple of uh, nonfiction science books. This was published in 2001, and luckily it was uh, released the day of 9-11 when the oh twin, twin Towers oh crashed. <laughs> so it was somewhat overshadowed. On the other hand, it was a finalist for uh, uh, Canadian Business Book of the Year, which I was happy about. And, and that's a, a survey of Canadian technology and to some extent based on the columns that I did for the Globe and Mail over a course of about 15 years. Um, a few years later, I wrote a book on nanotechnology, which is also well received. And uh, I have also written fiction. It seems to me that when you write nonfiction, you're up against the facts, and that is a battle that can be won. That when you're writing fiction, you're up against yourself, and that is a battle yes. you can never win, right? Because nothing you ever produce will be as grand as that initial vision you had of it, of that supernal book that. Uh, that uh, comes into your brain. I came to Canada in 1970 and I had a bachelor's degree from a small Catholic university in southern New York State where we were taught by monks. So that was a really interesting background. But when I came to Canada I realized if I wanted to get anywhere here I was going to have um, Canadian educational experience. I guess I was taking night school courses just in ordinary stuff and a couple of them suggested that I should go to university here and, and I applied to York and I, and I got in. Um, and I was very happy to, to do so. The first challenge that I learned about at York, and it's a challenge that served me my entire life, was how to do more than one thing at the same time. Mm -hmm. Because I had to go to night school to get my graduate English um, degree. And it was so worth it. Not only was the degree worth it and the information worth it, but the experience of working during the day and then having a separate life at night. And you know, having a separate life is a good thing for a writer because sooner or later you're going to have to have one. Eventually, I got a job first as a typist. Um, I've made a lot of money as a typist. I also got a job eventually as a um, editor, and I spent many happy years as an editor. Eventually, I became a senior editor at Harlequin Romance, and I decided that the time had come to be really serious about my writing, and I had four romance novels published. And then one day, I was in my office, which was really my bedroom, and my office, although in a different building, is still my bedroom today. But I was standing by the window, and I saw this really gorgeous police officer walk by on the street. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I'm wasting my time writing romance novels. I think I should write mystery novels. So then I had to go back to university again for criminology, which I did. But from that time on, I've been a mystery author, although I've had a million different day jobs in the meantime. So I became a, a filmmaker for the same reason that I think all filmmakers become filmmakers, is because we fall in love with movies, and we love them more than anything. Um, but uh, it took me a long, long time uh, to f learn the first painful lesson of being a filmmaker, and maybe a writer as well, is that loving movies and watching movies has absolutely nothing to do with making movies. They're incredibly <laughs> different tasks, and it's amazing how uh, people just ignore that when they decide, well, I like watching movies, I guess I'll have a career in making movies. Um, so uh, it took a long time for me to sort of really uh, get the courage to actually pursue a career in, in filmmaking because there's no roadmap, there's nowhere to go, you don't go to film directors, um, you know, the, the film director's company and, and submit a, a resume. You kind of have to make your own path. So uh, when I came to York to do my master's, I actually thought I was going to be a film professor. Um, and that was just um, a sidestep for me. It was a way to stay close to film without, you know, fully um, realizing that what I, I would never be truly satisfied until I was making films myself. Um, so uh, from there, uh, I sort of dithered around a bit, and eventually um, I was, uh, got my first screenwriting job through uh, someone I had gone to university with. She had gone on to become a producer at a, at a production company that specialized in making movies about animals that play sports. <laughs> uh, so that was, you know, you picture yourself writing Silence of the Lambs, and instead you're writing a movie about a monkey that does karate. Uh, true story. Anyway, so, um, and I was paid extremely, extremely low amounts of money to do those things, but 
eventually, um, the combination of, of grinding out a few of those and then making my own short films as a writer and a director got me an agent in Toronto. Um, and that's where I really started to sort of um, learn about the realities of the business. Uh, my first agent was incredibly ineffective, unfortunately, but <laughs> <laughs> led to a lot of meetings and a lot of networking. And in my particular industry, the film industry, it's, it's really all about networking. Um, this is true to, to various degrees of all forms of writing, but in film in particular, it, talent is a huge part of it. And hard work is an incredibly huge part of it. But being in the right place at the right time, or, or luck, is unfortunately a, a really huge part of it. So if you put yourself in as many different places as you can, that helps with that. Um, anyway, uh, all of this stuff sort of led to me uh, make, finally making a couple of feature films as a writer-director. And one of them was called uh, I Declare War. Uh, and that's available on iTunes and, and Netflix now. And that did quite well for me. It won a couple of film festivals. It played in the <coughs> TIFF. And, and I got an American agent, and, um, and it got a theatrical release in the U.S. And, and so, um, you know, it's sort of, I feel like I sort of stepped up to a different level of, of the game. And now I get to go to Los Angeles a couple times a year and take meetings there. And I'm, I'm you know, uh, there's a little bit more money, not a ton. But, um, uh, yeah, things seem to be evolving steadily. I went to York from 2005 to 2009 in their... Uh, professional writing major. I was in the technical writing stream. I'm not sure if that's still how it works. And then I minored in creative writing because I didn't get into the major. So it turned out to be a bit of a blessing in disguise. And uh, I got my first few writing jobs here, actually. So I was writing at the arena a few nights a week. They would pay me $20 to write an article about the men's league hockey games that were going on. So that was an easy way to make some fast money. And then I had a work-study job just down the hall in what was then called the, the STARS office. So I was doing their writing for their e-newsletters e and emails and any other promotional like brochures or anything they wanted to hand out. So that was a great, great first experience to get my feet in the door for, uh, for professional writing and actually being paid to write. And then after I graduated, I saw a posting at a small video game company downtown. They were going to try and make Facebook games. This was at the time when Farmville was exploding and all those, those Zynga type games. So they wanted to make one of those. So they were looking for a creative writer. So I was doing copy for them as well as writing storylines and things like that. And then after about six months there, I got a job at a bigger video game company in Vaughan, which is called Gans. So they make uh, kids toys and video games. Their big hit was called Webkins. I don't know if you guys are in that age range or not, but uh, around 2008, that was huge. So <laughs> I worked, started there for a couple of years working on Webkins, doing uh, marketing writing. So a lot of the things they sell are virtual items. So every virtual item needs a little line of coffee and then creating new pets and writing little storylines and things like that. And then luckily they started a new project where they were making really a full-scale game and they needed dialogue written and that type of thing so I got to move into that role which is really exciting for me because I'd always wanted to write film and TV and that type of thing so I actually got to write dialogue and then bring in voice actors and we would have them in the studio and that type of thing and I was also when I wasn't writing the scripts I'd be on the marketing side so doing their blogs and social media and any other materials they needed put together that was more on the technical side uh, so I was there for about five years, and uh, during my time there, I started at Ryerson in the MBA program part-time because I wanted to try and, and bolster my, my business savvy a bit, uh, especially for the marketing side of things. So I wrapped that up this year, and uh, I started a new job at Forster's Financial because a friend of mine was in the program, and they were looking for a marketing writer. So I've been there about six months now. So when I graduated, I guess some of my initial secretarial type jobs, maybe entry level clerical and, and typing and, and so on. Uh, but I still took great pride in being the author of my deliverables. And um, again, it was something that I had free reign to create for those missing documents, you know, for folks with their job aids, click here, click here. And uh, I was uh, a project coordinator at one of my positions and we had a staff and a budget for a documentation project for training materials. So I saw the financials and saw what all these tech writers were earning and I would, you know, do the Joe jobs and print their stuff down in the print copy room and, and you know, I'm looking at their information and I'm finding typos and grammatical errors. So you know, I go back to them and say, oh, we really shouldn't print this and distribute this across Canada just yet because blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so, you know, I was starting to do some editing and, you know, and 
they were very generous in suggesting that I get some courses and get certified in tech writing and I can do what they're doing and, you know, triple my income, basically. So I did. And I uh, took online courses at Humber College and started contracting almost immediately. Um, joined uh, Technical Writers Society or something, I'm not even sure um, if, if they're still in existence, but it was a great place to network. And they had job postings and there was something for a junior writer. The person who first hired me um, ended up being my lead in my current job some 15 years later. I never did finish the Humber course because the final credit was something like how to set up your own business and I'd already been doing that, how to get a job, I already had a job. So I didn't ever get my tech writing certificate. Years and years of a lot of doing the same thing, but it, it keeps evolving because everything I write has a very limited uh, shelf life because technology keeps evolving and new instructions need to be captured. There's more and more um, compliance requirements. There is a push and a pull in networking. Um, if you are a writer and you have the small soul of a writer, and anything that takes you away from writing, you begrudge. <laughs> um, eating can be a chore sometimes. If you want to spend all your time at the keyboard. I found over the years that I, I virtually have to force myself to network. It's always been useful. I broke into the Globe and Mail because when I'd been uh, an information officer at the National Research Council, Stephen Strauss was the Globe science reporter. We got to know each other. And then when I went out on my own, I. Well, my wife had to boot me and said, you know, um, I, I was holding off calling Stephen and offering my services as a science writer because I felt that would be trading on a friendship. And my lovely wife concentrated my mind and said, do it. I did it. And that opened just a ton of doors. Uh, I remember the first time, 1995, just before Christmas, I uh, uh, opened uh, the Globe and Mail and there was an article of mine that was reaching over a million people across Canada that day. And that felt good. So uh, whether or not you're an introvert, uh, I don't need to tell this to the extroverts. You're going to get out and mix and mingle anyway. But often a writer has an introspective uh, cast to himself or herself. Uh, you have to like yourself. You have to like spending time with yourself. That, that's the encounter with the self is how the writing gets done. So you may have to encourage yourself to get out there and mix and mingle, but it's always worthwhile. I love networking. I really, really love it. Um, partly because I really love people. And also because by networking you can keep your ear to the ground. You can find out what's going on. You can find out who's hot. You can find out who's looking for what. You have to balance this though with the love of solitude. And I love both things. I love to be by myself. I really, really love it. But sometimes I spend four, five, six hours by myself and I think, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> so um, I advocate networking a lot. However, I have to say, you have to like it. Because if you don't like it, or if you don't get yourself into a situation where you really want to do it, oh, you're just awful. You know, you say terrible things, sometimes you brag, uh, sometimes you're too shy. So you have to, you know, you have to really like it. But the bottom line about networking is you have to appear positive and you have to appear joyful. And if you hate networking, you're not going to do it. I like being alone, but I also, I like people. In screenwriting, it's particularly important because uh, you have to get the work out there. You know what I mean? Uh, film is such a collaborative medium that um, it's different from being a novel writer where your sphere of conversation about the work might be limited to maybe some editors or maybe a publisher or something like that, but in screenwriting you're going to get a lot of, it, you're never just going to hand over a script and then get a check, you know, it's going to be a conversation, there's going to be rewrites and rewrites and rewrites and, and so uh, interacting with people is just inherent, I think, to the craft. It's a fine line as well, I mean, you can network <coughs> badly as well, you, you can be that person that's at the party that's just haranguing someone and, <laughs> and uh, being a pest, you know, like that's, that's, that's a tough, you know, got, you gotta, you know, re recognize what the line is. And here's the secret trick to networking in film, everybody loves movies, everybody loves talking about movies, so that's an easy conversation to start at any party, you know, have you seen The Martian? Didn't it suck? The really maddening thing about networking is you, it could work immediately or it could 
lay dormant for 10 years and come back and help you out. Mm -hmm. So that's just something to remember. Don't get discouraged if nothing happens immediately because things will come, you know, can come back around way later. And the other thing I wanted to say is that the, the secret to networking is actually not to network. It's just to be yourself and talk and have a conversation. And, and like, all you have to do is just say, hey, uh, you know, I'm, I'm Sally, I like to write crime stories. You know what I mean? Like, and that's it. You don't have to like tell them what you're working on and push, 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 because then you're just that dude, <laughs> you know, like, and you don't want to be that person. I went to a film festival and there was another filmmaker there and um, we both had films in this festival and we just hung out for a couple of days and really, really hit it off and uh, went our separate ways and talked to him for like six months. And then I got a phone call from the estate of Philip K. Dick and they were like, hey, we're working with Charlie. He said you were really into, you know, this kind of material. We're looking for new directors, blah, blah, blah. And it was just like, boom, that's how it happens. And I never once hit Charlie up for a job. We just vibed on the kind of movies we liked. Last year when I was looking for work, I had to do a lot of networking. And it really was a huge struggle for me because I had to consci conscientiously be trying to push myself out of my comfort zone because I really don't want to do it. Um, like, I know there's networking after this, and I'm a little nervous about that. And you all seem very nice, and there's no reason to be nervous. But uh, it's just not something I would ever do if I didn't feel like it, it was necessary to progress my career. So what I would try to do is because I wasn't very good at networking events is I would try and set up as many informational interviews as I could with people that I either knew or contacts with people that I knew. So that way you're just kind of, usually I would say, can I come down and meet you at your lunch because then you don't inconvenience them too much and you just have coffee for 10 minutes or whatever and you ask them about their job and you tell them a bit about what you're good at. And then I find I would just start with people that I knew well and I was going to have good conversations with even if I didn't see a direct in to a job there. And then you never know because every company is having someone do their writing. So if you just talk to anybody there, maybe they know the person that runs the marketing department and you just kind of keep moving along the chain until you develop better and better leads. So that would be my advice, is to, to go with whatever route you're comfortable with. If it's not career fairs and that type of thing, then try and set up more intimate situations. I use LinkedIn a lot uh, myself. I strong believer in networking and building relationships with placement agents because I contract and eventually a six month gig may extend, it may not, and three months before I need to start putting my feelers out, out or have agents put their feelers out that oh so and so is going to be available next month or in two months. So it's a wonderful way to have a steady flow of contracts. So I can work 12 months a year or I could take a break if I wanted to. In terms of working uh, with my peers in different departments like content um, specialists or that sort of thing. I might be doing something for a client but still you never know who's um, internal that maybe the, the company has something in the pipe that I don't quite have the skill set for and I, I've heard about it, you know, at the water cooler or whatever that you know something's coming up and it's like oh I want to be involved because I know this project's wrapping up so it's um, a great uh, tool I guess to to find out you know where I might be lacking or what I need to to build up my skills and network and and get in the loop with key contacts and and maybe you know job shadow someone because uh, something's ending in one realm and yet I've got my foot in the door with the company already you know so I could start to maybe job shadow and learn and, and transfer skills and uh, keep perpetuating contract extensions. Things that happened years ago come back and there's a kind of fulfillment there. Something happened to me yesterday that was utterly unexpected. I'm uh, meeting with uh, several of the tenured professors uh, in uh, science and technology studies, my fellow doctoral students. And the idea came up that not only are we doing this really interesting research, it's the science of science, how science is really done, how does a fact get established, how is research actually contracted. Um, but nobody knows about this. So the idea arose, well, there should be some kind of outreach. Uh, we need to tell the story. And as one, you know, 15 heads swiveled and looked at me. <laughs> and now I'm in for it, right? I'm going to have to start a seminar among my uh, colleagues in science and technology studies, coaching them in how to write for a uh, non-academic public 
and how to get their stories into the public media, which uh, is going to be really interesting. So a day in the life is, I guess, dealing with geeks and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it is about 50-50 in, in uh, working with them and working on my own. I have a lot of independent uh, flexibility with my hours and that sort of thing and what works with their schedule. Um, to work with them, I have to be flexible to meet them. They have their own job to do and quite often it's not in there job description to write the job aid or, or to teach me, you know, but at the same time if they die there's no backup information and <laughs> so it needs to be captured. To give you an idea of a typical week for me, so I'm organizing the November social media calendar at work. So what's going to be posted every day, uh, making sure they hit all our major events and the services and the other things we're trying to promote. Uh, I also like I'm just constantly looking for ways to keep it interesting for me because I think that'll be interesting for readers no matter what I'm writing about. So. Uh, just this morning we had a workshop where I invited a financial planner in because finance is not the most exciting subject, but you can kind of spin it, I think. So I had all the sort of young professionals in the office come and sit in and she talked for two hours and just kind of gave them pointers about how to manage their money and retirement and all those super exciting things. And then I'm just going to turn that into a top 10 list of what our staff learned at this workshop for our blog and I'm going to put that out in a couple weeks. So it's, it's just constantly looking for ways to, to keep things interesting for me and then that is what makes the jobs more fun. So when I'm lucky enough to be getting paid to write a script, uh, I try to be very rigorous with my, with my schedule, um, which boils down to one thing for me, which is getting off the fucking internet <laughs> <laughs> and isolating myself. Um, now, uh, having done that, it, it, you know, the overwhelming and intimidating task of, of writing a story, um, I sort of just break down by, by going back to the craft. I, I did believe as a young person that you couldn't be taught to write, that it was just a, a God-given skill. And so I, uh, after years of obnoxious ignorance, I finally learned that no, it's a craft, like drawing or, or sculpture or anything, and for 5,000 years people have been telling stories in a particular way, and it would behoove you to learn how to do that. And so um, I always recommend this incredible, this book that I still read like regularly when I'm writing scripts called Story by Robert McKee. It's quite a well-known book. And, and um, he lays out a, a template for, for the craft of, of, uh, of research and, and design um, and, uh, and trial and error and experimentation. And, and it's, uh, every time I have a new uh, project, I literally reread the I'm literally rereading that book right now. That's what I did all morning this morning. Because when you have a particular, a specific idea in mind as you go through the book, you can't help but develop the idea into the form you need it to be. Um, and screenwriting in particular, maybe more so than, than novels, uh, it's such a um, rigid form, you know what I mean? Like, uh, you're free to obviously to experiment within it, but, but the industry expects a certain form. And, uh, and, and an audience demands a certain, uh, you know, uh, they demand a story. Uh, and there, the, you know, there is a there is a, a way to tell a story that you need to know if you're going to do this for a living. Anyway, having said all that, um, when I'm being paid to write a script, I try to set aside a minimum of three hours of my day for where I go to a cafe or a library, and I don't bring my phone, I don't bring the internet, I bring it like an iPod. Um, shuffle that it doesn't connect to the internet at all so I can listen to music and I have an electronic keyboard and it does one thing and one thing only it types words it doesn't check email it doesn't download stocks it doesn't do anything except type and so uh, with my retro futurist package I just isolate and I write 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 most of my life I had day jobs and in the years in which I had day jobs which is up until about two years ago um, all, most of the jobs were 9 to 5. Now, of course, they're 24-7. And my last job, I, I worked selling books at Indigo, which I really loved. But that was shift work and stuff like that. So the idea of having an organized day is at the center of my life. And without that, I just, I, I just don't feel like myself. So under ordinary circumstances, I have many tasks. Some of them have to do with teaching. Some of them have to do with um, the internet. Some of them have to do with business, but I'm always working on a project and I make sure that I always work on that project every day. And even if I have to only work on that project 10 minutes, I will work on that project. Because to me, what counts is the continuity. I set aside time for writing and I usually do it last 
And the reason I usually do it last is because all the other things are off my mind then. All the emails are answered, all the uh, appearances have been, you know, uh, arranged. So I wait until my mind has in, in, in nothing but my work. And I try to do that every single day. And I've done that for many, many years. One thing I never do, and I stopped doing this the first time I went to graduate school so many years ago, for, I went for one term at that monastery. And one day I woke up and I thought, I am never, as long as I live, doing an all-nighter again. And I never did. I could say that I don't have a typical day, and I've never had a typical day, and that's one of the joys about being a writer. I mean, there's a lot of dog shit about being a writer. <laughs> but the freedom can be absolutely amazing. When I worked for the National Research Council, I was getting paid to talk to people, Nobel laureates and, and future Nobel laureates, simply asking them what they did and then turning around and reporting that to my, uh, my fellow man and woman in the street, and, and that was an absolute joy. I would fly all over North America doing this. I remember one time, uh, I was sent down by my editor from Ottawa to the University of Guelph to interview a radio astronomer, but he'd heard about uh, Cygnus X1, which was uh, an X-ray source, I think the first one discovered. And as memory serves, it was in the southern sky, so he ran down to a radio telescope in Chile. I knocked on his door, there was nobody there. Okay, fine. <laughs> Walked down the hall, and here was uh, the Norman Rockwell professor, balding, a uh, bit of fringe of gray hair, smoking a pipe, uh, full suit, typing away. I knocked on his door and said, I'm a science writer, what do you do? And he said, you want to talk? You really want to talk? No one had ever asked him that wow. question before. And it turned out that he was the ranking world expert in nematodes, which are little tiny worms. They live in the soil and in trees. And he had, <laughs> still amazes me, he had discovered um, some fungi that, like killer plants, would intercept and kill these nematodes and suck their guts out and use the nitrogen that they so found to reproduce. Uh, it's like the little shop of horrors, but on the scale of, of, of microns. Uh, Haptoglossum mirabilis was uh, one of the, um, the strains that he'd found. Um, it actually inserted a, a hypodermic into a passing nematode and would pull out its innards and then use the, uh, the uh, uh, organic compounds to reproduce itself. Another fungus uh, had a, a, a noose, a tiny noose, uh, far smaller than a millimeter. And uh, when a nematode passed through it, uh, it had an infrared sensor, the noose would tighten and strangle. <laughs> so, so I came back with this amazing story that was just latent there. Nobody knew about this. Um, Art directed a cartoonist in uh, illustrating uh, some of these things, and that story was picked up by wire services and went around the world. We did some metrics and we figured out that uh, something like 150 million people had read it. Now, when something like that happens, it's good to be a writer, I tell you. Uh, there are payoffs to being a writer, you know, for all the BS you have to go through that you simply cannot find anywhere else. It's walking on the clouds. My best experience as a writer is, and it happens every once in a while, I'm really happy to say, and that is when a total stranger, not someone that I know, not someone that knows anybody that I know, comes up and says to me, you're Rosemary O'Bear, I love your books. And I can't tell you how that feels. Mm -hmm. But it has to be a perfect stranger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't say there's a lot of work, no, but there are quite a few studios popping up in Toronto. And if you're willing to move around Canada, then there's, there's some in Montreal and out east and uh, Vancouver as well. So there's work there like for the persistent, I would say, but it, it's not like readily available. Uh, a lot of it is contract. So you have to be kind of comfortable with that lifestyle of, of working three months at a time, not knowing if you're going to be renewed until to write up at the end. I'm going to give a more philosophical answer to your question, which is, who gives a shit if there's a lot of work out there? Yeah. you got a story to tell, right? The number one word you're going to hear as a writer, a professional writer, is no. That's <laughs> and, for sure. and you're going to hear that word a hundred times a day for, t t thir for your whole life. Your whole life. Yeah. And you have to ignore that word. Uh, and you have to just persist because every you'll, you'll hear 900 no's and then you'll hear a yes 
And that yes is going to lead to a published book. And that published book is going to lead to a total stranger coming up to you and telling you that you made their day. Uh, and that's what you became a writer for. There's always an appetite for storytelling, whether that's in video games or novels or film and television. Um, th there are two things happening right now. One is that audiences are fragmenting um, hugely. Uh, they're becoming smaller and more specific. So we don't have three television channels, we don't have a hundred television channels, we have a thousand television channels. And each show on those channels um, has a, a smaller audience, but they need shows. We need shows, right? There are more shows in production than ever before. And a lot of them are really good. So in that sense, there's more work. Um, but of course, the corollary to that is that it's in insanely competitive. Um, and so, yeah, you're going to have to be persistent, you're going to have to be good, um, you're going to have to be in the right place at the right time. Um, so, so, you know, it's not really a, a, a clear and concise answer, yes and no is the answer, but the more important answer in my mind is who gives a sh You can make a decent living, it can be powerless at times, but writing nonfiction, you know, you can get by. Uh, but writing fiction, Robertson Davies said it best, he said there's only one reason to write a book of fiction and that is the absolute certainty that you're going to die or go crazy if you don't do it. That's right. That is the story that yeah. must come out of you. 1999, day after Labor Day, I was uh, in Vancouver out in my sun deck and this character walked into my head. That's the only way I can describe it. He's a young uh, native Canadian. Um, not much schooling, but he has this incredible talent for finding corpses underwater. And I thought, where did he come from? Where is he going? Who does he know? Uh, what's going to happen to him? And <laughs> a novel resulted. I mean, I, I write fiction to find out what happened. Okay? So if that's what you're doing, God bless you. Never let anybody say don't do it. And with reference to someone walking into your head and walking into your life and walking into your heart, not necessarily walking into your wallet. <laughs> the same thing happened to me with the Alice Portal character. He's a, a, a person, uh, by this series he has redeemed a great part, by this book in the series he has redeemed a great part of his life. But in the first book he lives in a cardboard box in the valley of the Don River. And just, uh, I don't want it to sound like too like airy-fairy, but just to have all these years of living with that person. And I'll tell you, I, I'm ashamed of this in a way, but I've also lived with three husbands in that time, and really, Ella's portal like <laughs> sort of stuck it out better than two of them. <laughs> anyway, um, it, it comes into your head, and it won't go away. You really have to be willing to earn money in another way. You have to. And for myself, I had a lot of wonderful day jobs. I was a senior editor at Harlequin Romance. I sold books in, in Indigo, which I really liked, and best of all, for 10 years I was a bailiff in the criminal courts and sat in criminal cases every single day, and sometimes I went overnight with juries. It was wonderful. That's it was cool. the best yeah. day job I ever had. And having a day job, you have to choose something that you know you're going to enjoy also. But always you remember, I'm a writer, I'm a writer. I'm, I'm a bailiff in the courts, but really, I'm a writer. And each time that I had one of these marvelous jobs and I saw the opportunity to rise in the company or to get a better job in the courts, I backed off because I wasn't that. I was a writer. And I knew if I allowed myself to be sucked into these jobs, I would never write again. And, and really, it's what you said. I'm, I'm here to write, whether, I, whether it's been an easy life or not. I'm here to write. I, didn't, I had day jobs too. I, I didn't support myself solely off my writing until maybe five years ago. I'm 42. And because I'm married to a woman who supports me, helped support me until I could get to that point. And I support myself now, but it's, it, it, if you're looking for a way to make money, commerce is that way. Trial and error and doing sort of learning what you love maybe, like reading voraciously is a big, big part of writing yeah. is reading. My master's degree was in English literature. And I had the opportunity to read the best authors, just the best authors. And one or two of them inspired me for the rest of my life, for example, Dickens. Now that might not be someone that you're interested in, but I think what you have to do as a writer, you have to find your passion. If you go at it for a whole lifetime, you'll find different passions. You know, you'll find, right now, I'm so interested in talking to this man because my hobby is science. I, I don't have any training in science. And I just finished a book of poetry about Isaac Newton. 
<laughs> because that was a passion. Something grips you and you, you do it. And as you um, advance in your career, you will become more precise in the things that grip you and you'll become more able to see that something grips you and you can make a book out of it and something grips you and you'll never make a book out of it. But you have to, pr you have to keep going. And right and right and right. Never stop. And be patient too. Don't feel like you have to have figured it out by the end of your degree. You know, or the end like, of your life. Or the end of your life. Yeah. yeah, it's an evolving thing. About 2008, there was a bit of a uh, a slump in the technology world, and I couldn't get a contract for the life of me. And um, I thought, well, that seems to be all I know that that you know I'm really comfortable with as my career choice. And I thought, well, I need to look at something else. I was very interested in nutrition and wellness and, you know, that realm. And so I took some courses in that and for personal interest. And I thought, well, there's a gap in the documentation. People need to be told, instead of click here, I could capture eat this, eat this, stretch this, stretch this, mm. you know, drink this, drink this, all this you know, transferring the way I would interpret the information into easily user-friendly, you know, doable tasks. And I, you know, got my um, certificate in holistic nutrition. Couldn't seem to get any work in that. So I, again, asserted myself in the world and opened a blog and got a website and started to get clients, but I wasn't comfortable taking money from you know my network <laughs> I just wanted to help them for free so that wasn't lucrative and I knew I couldn't sustain the lifestyle to which I'd become accustomed and um, technology picked up and I kind of dropped that like a hot potato I, I still um, pursue it as a hobby and nothing more at least was able to transfer my how to create sentence structure and, and all that sort of information and page layout and the white space and marketing and that kind of thing was still useful. It was the question, I was looking in the mirror, what am I gonna do? It's all I, you know, really know. So again, it's a matter of marrying two worlds. I've had agent nightmares that you would not believe. If I wrote it in fiction, you wouldn't believe it. So I'm sorry, I got nothing to say. <laughs> My agent always said that uh, when you start publishing, if you're any good, an agent will find you. There's a psychological component to it where if if you pursue an agent, they're not interested, mm. right? It's yeah. like dating. Mm. Um, it is. Mm. That's right. It, it, and, uh, you know, uh, there's this really amazing um, uh, essay that one of my favorite screenwriters named Bill Wheeler wrote, and he said, the way to get an agent is to write, you know, like, pr like go into the darkest parts of your soul and write the most you know incredible script you you could possibly write and then just like open your front door throw it out in the street and lock the door and they'll come pounding <laughs> you know to get it which is you know obviously a little facetious um so i had two experiences getting an agent one i pursued an agent um and uh you know i've had two different canadian agents the first was not that effective the second has been extremely effective but i you know i pursued her and that's paid off and you know um when it comes to screenwriting in canada there's not very many agents and they're listed on the writers guild of canada website if you just go to wgc.ca you can find the like 18 literary agents in canada for screenwriting and you can send them you know an inquiry letter um and you'll be one of 150 they get that day Again, it's very competitive. And if, especially if you have nothing in particular to say other than, hey, I'm a screenwriter, here's my script. Like, if you can say you've been in a festival or you won an award, that's, that's a huge help. So that's a part of it. But again, the more sort of like exciting part of it was when I got an American agent and that happened after my film got into TIFF. And they came to me. You know, I was very, very lucky. Very lucky. Um, and so, um, that's, yeah, that's kind of the brutal truth of it, is that, that when it really matters, they're going to come to you. But the way to get them to come to you is to do great work, get it out there. I've been involved in community theater over the years, so and on the executive and that sort of thing. And <clears throat> I found that it might be uh, useful if you're trying to build up something in your portfolio or your experience and you're very new at things. So there was always opportunities where you need a secretary or someone to take minutes or someone to create the, the poster for the play. Or there's all sorts of documentation credits you can get through volunteering your 
writing ability, people will run, oh, we need someone to do this, and but why not take a stab at it to build up, you know, some experience. So when you're approaching an agent, you have all kinds of things, and they don't know in, maybe to what extent it, it took to get to your end state of that particular item, but you've got, you're building up your own credit. There's a couple of things you want to do. It's not just when you're sending a, a query to, to an agent. It's really to anybody. And that is you want to distinguish yourself from other people. And if you can say that you've done all this volunteer work, it makes you and your letter different from other people's letters. You learn to develop an angle. Occasionally I write poetry books. I've had several published. And I spent this year writing one about Isaac Newton. And my angle about writing about Isaac Newton is that I went to Cambridge University as a summer student and I went to the places where he worked and I, and I saw his, the objects that he actually handled. So my angle is that my interest is profound enough that I would take that extra step to familiarize myself not just with the man but also with his milieu and his belongings. So you know that, that's something that I think not very many people can put in their poetry query letter because you're looking for an angle, you're looking for some concentration of energy and ideas that makes you different from the other people that the agent or the publisher is going to see. And I want to say one other thing. There are very limited uh, agents in, in Canada. In a way, that's an advantage because networking for an agent can work for you in Canada. I, I once had, well, for a long time, I had a New York agent. It didn't work out so well. Uh, like really didn't. But anyway, in, in Toronto I feel that if you're looking for an agent, you have an advantage because there's only a few. Most of them are pretty friendly. They're not going to like, you know, make you never want to be a writer again. Of course, you have to research them and you use the internet to do that. When I was a young writer, I was under this assumption, I don't know where this even came from, I guess movies and television, that when I got an agent, the agent was going to find me work. And I could just sit there and write stories, and they would just phone me and be like, hey, Spielberg wants a script. Every once in a while, somebody lucks out. Yeah. But you never, you can never make it be you. You can't make you be the one that lucks out. Day to day of having an agent is that they can introduce you to people, yeah. and they can set up meetings, and they can legitimize you. Oh, but yeah. they're, not, they're not calling you and saying, there's a check on my desk, come and get it. That's my right. agent has also been destroyed by technology. What do you mean? Uh, well, um, let's see, I got him in 1995 and his modus operandi. Uh, he and I would sit down over martinis, I'd come up with some ideas, he would take some of these ideas, pitch them to publishers over more martinis, <laughs> uh, get me an offer, that's, that's how wow. these two books came. Um, 2001, I got a $20,000 advance for this thing. 2003, I got a $30,000 advance. U.S. funds in that, and now it's nothing. Okay? Yeah. Uh, technology has just changed the right. whole concept Absolutely. of publishing. You mean it's changed the book publishing? Oh, yeah, 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 very much so. But uh, people through the Internet have learned, unfortunately, that they can get all kinds of decent writing and not pay a penny. So oh, yeah, uh, the thought sad. that people would actually pay you for your words of wisdom and yeah. beauty is uh, seems to be an idea whose time has gone. It's the 20th century. Yeah, so my agent is uh, kind of in suspended animation now. You know, he's like, uh, you know, sleeping in liquid nitrogen. So. <laughs> uh, that's one reason I went back to academia, which I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying. If you're the right kind of person, and you can roll with these punches, this is a really interesting life. <laughs> this is a way better life than like being a housewife. I, I'm not, probably not supposed to say stuff like this. I, I'm actually a housewife too. But you know, when I think of myself as a child, and I think of the dreams I had for myself, I don't have to think, Oh, that never happened, and here I am, a school teacher in Niagara Falls, New York. I can say, I walked down Fifth Avenue. Taught by monks. You know, I, the, mon the monks were good, you know, I didn't mind the monks. <laughs> Nuns. But anyway, uh, I can say, 
even though it turned into a disaster, not a financial disaster, just a psychological disaster, I can say that I walked down Fifth Avenue thinking, I just had lunch with my New York agent. Yeah. And it was true. Yeah. I look back on that little girl and I think, you know what, kid, you may not be famous, but you did it. <laughs> and you know, that idea of sticking to it until you get that feeling that you did it, whatever the you did it is for you. I'll tell you, I teach a lot of wonderful students, and for a lot of them, the you did it is just that they finished the book. Right. Was it uh, Lord Chesterfield who said, I would rather be sorry for what I had done than for what I had not done? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and Victor Hugo said, and I love this one, to be a writer is a dog's life, but it's the only life. Yes, he did. <laughs> and I'll tell you what Mark Twain said about smoking. And I always tell my students, this is what I say about writing. Quitting is easy. I've done it a thousand times. <laughs> so you just keep at it. In Canada, it's a smaller pool so it's easier to be a bigger fish. Um, in the States, there's more money, and there's more, there are more companies to approach, but it's in, it viciously competitive, you know, especially in Los Angeles. People come from literally all over the world every day to compete in Los Angeles. So, I mean, I guess I feel like I would, I would encourage you to start, I mean, Toronto is, is, is sort of like in the midst of an explosive growth, you know, like uh, there are lots of film companies here doing lots of interesting stuff. And, and if you can write a good script with a good story, I mean, um, you got the world on a string, you know. Um, so, so I guess I, guess I would, yeah, as a beginner, I would sort of encourage you to, you know, write something and then um, look up all the different production companies, feature film production companies, if that's what you're doing in Toronto, and literally knock on doors. And a lot of, again, a lot of them will say we don't take unsolicited submissions, but maybe you'll get one or two meetings, you know. There are, there are also, like, screenwriting groups you can, you can join on Facebook, and they have, like, regular drinks nights you can go and hang out and stuff like that. So... Um, yeah, I guess I guess I would encourage Canada, and then, like the rest of the world, you know, LA or the American market is like the big Kahuna. That's kind of like establish yourself here and then move on. Consider going into academia. Uh, it has its drawbacks, but it can give you a base from which you can then network and you can continue writing. Uh, again, serendipity. Um, I went down to give a paper at the University of Iowa last week, uh, essentially outlining the program of research I wanted to undertake for my doctorate. And I just barked my shins on this amazing group of people. Um, it turns out University of Iowa has an enormous repository of uh, science fiction, including original manuscripts, uh, I think Philip K. Dick, certainly Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, the Golden Age, A.E. Van Vogt, uh, Isaac Asimov. So I'll be going back there. And the people to whom I was talking, um, I just clicked with. They get my academics. They get who and where I'm coming from as a, as a writer. Um, so I'm having such a good time in the academy that I would uh, advise any of you at least to consider that. Formerly, these, these jobs were all sort of uh, spread out over the whole industry, publicist and, you know, manager and all this stuff, but you're taking on a lot of it yourself in the age of the internet. People get signed to movie deals off shorts, comedy shorts, you know, and, and so having, um, having a lot of views on YouTube can be the equivalent of winning an award in a film festival. Um, there's still a hierarchy, you know, like I still feel like like an award at Sundance is still worth more than like a million views on YouTube, but maybe 50 million views is worth more than an award on you at Sundance. Um, but, uh, but, but regardless uh, of how you get some sort of audience or some sort of recognition, it's, that's, it's all currency. And that's what you're looking for as you try to move, you know, up the chain. And, and you meet with a production company and you can say, you know, I've been recognized by this film festival or, you know, 5,000 people think I'm hilarious. If you have accomplishments and somebody else is going for the same thing and they don't, they're going to look at you first. I think you want to meet with production companies and, and tell them about that. Meet with them and say, look, I have an audience. Uh, do, you want to, do you want to join me and my audience and show commercials during, like, that's a pretty great starting, it's like, Rosemary says, like, that's a great way to distinguish yourself. Um, but you also, and I guess this is another important thing, you need to know what you want to do, you know? Like, do you want to um, write, you know, create a, a, like a 30-minute comedy show in the vein of uh, Trailer Park Boys? Or do you want to write feature films like Trainwreck or something like that, you know? And so when you go in, you can tell people, this is what I've done, this is what I want to do, 
Uh, and the best position, and this is similar to the agent conversation, is like you don't go in there saying, can I please have a job? You go in saying, uh, do you want to partner up with me because I'm on my way. You don't want to be like arrogant about it. No. In my business, you write query letters, which means you write a one-page letter that tells them everything you want them to know immediately. And you start off with a, an important sentence, and then you describe the project, and then you put your qualifications, and then you ask them you know, to see your project. And it's a really good idea for everybody at all times to have this kind of letter, in, at least in mind. And you start off by introducing yourself. For example, in your case, I am a person who has an audience of 40,000 people on my blog. That's a great opener because it's hard to ignore. I wouldn't ignore it, and I'm not even in the business. So you start with a sentence like that, and then you describe the project that you have in mind, and then you say what your credentials are. You've already got credentials, which is great. And then you say, can I interest you in this project, or where can I send this information, or something like that. But no matter what you're doing, you should have this mental query letter in your mind all the time. This is one of the hardest things I did in my career. Many years ago when I was an editor, I had to present projects to the roughened old salesmen in the publishing house that I worked for. Now, we don't have them anymore, but in the old yeah. days, in the old days, you publish a book and then the salesmen would take it um, out into the market and browbeat the booksellers <laughs> into putting your book in their store. And they were the toughest, toughest people. And I used to have to, and I was an editor, and I was an editor of fiction, and I was always the same as I am now, which I have good ideas, but I'm basically a, sh a shy person and I don't like pushing stuff on people. So I had to get up with these wizened old guys, they were always old men in those days, and I had to convince them that this lovely little novelist that I was editing was going to be a big seller in all their bookstores, and I absolutely hated it. One time, I did convince them, it was the first novel, and the novelist went on, she didn't become famous, but she became well known and she wrote several novels, but anyway, here's what they said. They said, if you can't convince me in four seconds that I should sell this book, I don't want to hear any of your garbage. Said, okay, four <laughs> seconds. So you should think that way, you should think that way all the time. If I was gonna describe myself in four seconds, I would say I have 18 published books. That says something about me that not very many people can say, four seconds. And, and you know, you should go around all the time. You can change your four seconds to, to suit the person you're talking to. You can change the four seconds to suit your project. You can change the four seconds to suit your mood, depending on how you write, but four seconds. I would disagree with Rosemary about something. She said you, you mustn't be arrogant. I think you have to. No, <laughs> don't be just, arrogant. No, 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 just don't <laughs> seem arrogant, oh, that's okay? Different. Suppress it. <laughs> that's different. But to believe <laughs> that people are going to give you money for something as nebulous as words is the, yeah. the apotheosis of arrogance.